Well, hello there, Radiant Church. It's so good to be with you this weekend. We love you. We are so excited about all the watch parties that are going on right now. So big shout out to you if you are part of a watch party. Some of you are just at home by yourself. You and Jesus make a watch party. And so we just... Uh, Love you, we celebrate that, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing across all of our platforms the hashtag, hashtag Radiant Watch Party, so that we can uh, celebrate what God is doing and also just uh, rejoice with you guys where you're at. We are so looking forward to being back together again. If you have not seen the video that was posted on social media, Uh, about our plan for regathering in our campuses again. Please go and look for that on Facebook or Instagram. It's available there. Uh, We're looking forward to Sunday night, the 28th, June 28th, as being a night of worship at both of our campuses, and then the weekend of the 4th and the 5th of July that is coming up very quickly. At both of our campuses, we're going to have live services as well as our online services continuing without childcare in our facilities. And then the following weekend, July 11th and 12th, we'll be back in with kids ministry available. And we just wanna say this, we are going to continue to utilize the online presence that we have across all three of our platforms. We know that many of you are not ready to come back into buildings yet and for various different reasons. And we want you to know we honor that, we respect that. You're still gonna be able to track with us and, uh, and engage with what's going on here at Radiant Church, whether you're in the building or not. And uh, we just want to let you know that wherever you are, however you're engaging with us, it's so good to be radiant and it's gonna be so good to be back together. And uh, we're looking forward to the next season and the next time period that God has for us as a church family. I wanna invite you, if you have your Bibles available with you, to take them, open them up to the book of Numbers, chapter 13. During the last three, three and a half months, uh, a time period which will go down in history, which we will all remember for the rest of our lives, we have been zeroing in on how God is speaking to us out of the story of the exodus of God's people. Started all the way back at Easter or Passover. Then we touched on it in Pentecost at the end of May and all in between. And there's kind of been subsets. We started off with the Passover theme and then lessons from the wilderness. And now we're gonna shift gears into the book of Numbers. And over the next couple of weeks, I wanna minister out of the book of Numbers and out of this part of the Exodus story in which God brings the children of Israel right up to the border of Canaan or the promised land and allows them to see the land, allows them to see the land that flows with milk and honey, the promised land. And what we're going to look at today is the story of how they first saw the land. Now what you're gonna realize pretty quickly is even though they saw the land, it was 40 more years before Israel was permitted to go in and actually possess the land. It's because this first generation that were the slaves that God brought out of Egypt, they were unable to trust God enough so that he could take them in to inherit the promises. A whole generation dies in the wilderness, not because of God's inability, but because of their unwillingness to trust and to believe God. And so as we're looking at this part of the Exodus story, this week talking about the generation that was able to spy out the land, but not go in and take the land. And then next weekend, uh, which is Father's Day, we're going to have a very special guest bringing a message to us. Uh, One of our overseers, Pastor Jimmy Evans, has a message for Radiant Church on fathering and the power of fathering. You're not gonna wanna miss that weekend. But the following weekend, I'm gonna bring a final message in this Exodus series about crossing over and possessing the promised land out of the book of Joshua. But today, if you have your Bibles, we're gonna look at Numbers 13. We're gonna jump around a little bit instead of reading the whole chapter, but follow along with me. In verse number one, it says, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, send men to spy out the land of Canaan, 
which I am giving to the people of Israel. For from each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, every one a chief among them. And so Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of them men who were heads of the people of Israel. Now jump down to verse number 17. It says, Moses sent them in to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, Go up into the Negev, that's the, the hill country, and go up into the hill country and see what the land is and whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many, and whether the land that they dwell in is good or bad, and whether the cities that they dwell in are camps or strongholds, and whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are trees in it or not, be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time uh, was the season of the first ripe grapes. Now jump down, if you will, to verse number 30. Verse number 30, it says, but Caleb quieted the people before Moses and he said, let us go up at once and occupy it. Talking about the land for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out saying, the land through which we have gone in to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants and all the people that we saw in it are of great stature or of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who came from the Nephilim, and we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. And so we seemed to them. At the beginning of this season that maybe we would call the season of COVID-19, pandemic, that then merged into a season or a time period of protest and tension, racial tensions in our nation, as well as an economic period of time in which our national economy was paralyzed, this will be remembered as a season unlike any other season that you or I have ever gone through. I remember hearing stories of when my grandparents talk about growing up as little kids in the Great Depression and thinking to myself, well, that will never happen again. We'll never see a time like that again. I remember hearing stories from people who went through World War II and even seeing stories on documentaries of people who were Jewish who lived through the concentration and the death camps that the Nazis had set up and thinking to myself, well, we'll probably never go through a season of time like that in history again, only to come into 2020. And so here we are, and obviously it's not near of what a, a world war was and it can't even be compared or on scale necessarily with the death camps at Auschwitz or, or other places in Europe that the Nazis exterminated 6.5 million Jewish people. And I'm sure it can't be compared to some other times, but in our generation, this will be one of the most memorable moments that we have ever lived through. And you will remember that at the beginning of this time period, I highlighted the things that I believed God was speaking to us about how he was shaking in the midst of all these things that are taking place in a broken world, how God was also shaking the idols and the powers of our generation and of our culture. How he was literally shaking the things that we put our confidence in, that much like idols, things that we oftentimes prioritize above God. And I asked the question, what type of person do you want to be when you come out the other side of it? What kind of people do we wanna be? What kind of church do we wanna be when we come out of this time period? Because just like the nation of Israel who wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, there was a time in which they shifted not just from slavery out of Egypt into wilderness wandering, but they went from wandering in the wilderness to crossing over and actually possessing the promises of God. The first time they came up to 
the borders of the land that we just read about, they actually failed in their attempt to possess the promised land. The second time they came under the leadership of Joshua, 40 years later, they were able to go in. God miraculously separates the Jordan River and they cross over into the promised land and they defeat their enemies and they take possession of the land. Well, what was the difference? Well, the difference had everything to do with their belief systems between the first attempt and the second attempt 40 years later. You see, a different generation rose up under different leadership with a different mentality. Moses was a leader that could easily get them out of Egypt, but he couldn't get them into the promised land. There was an old mindset in Joshua chapter one. It says, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, Joshua, rise up, take these people into the promised land. There was a change in leadership because Moses's mentality and Joshua's mentality were vastly different. God had called and equipped each of them uniquely for the task that they were called to. And I can't help but wonder, I can't help but ponder and think about the kind of people and the kind of church, and I'm not just talking about Radiant, I'm talking about the church, God's church, who he wants us to be when we come out of this period and we prepare to cross over into the next decade, into the next five, 10, 15 years, because make no mistake about it, what lies on the horizons for us, the way that culture is gonna look, the way that the world is gonna look, the way that we're going to think, is going to be determined in large part by how we respond to the season that we are in. And we've gotta ask ourselves, are we going to be shaped more by the chaos than we are by the creative hand of God who graciously and mercifully shapes us to be the people that he needs us to be in the next hour. You see, I don't believe that the church is just like some little sailboat that finds itself at sea in the middle of a hurricane just getting blown about and we're on this tiny little sailboat hoping that we're gonna land someplace. You see, when God looks at the world, he doesn't see the world, he doesn't read the headlines, he doesn't watch the news, and he doesn't follow Twitter feeds. When God looks at history, he doesn't look at the world first and then take care of the church second. He looks at the church first as the tip of the spear about everything that God is doing and shaping and determining in human history and everything else is secondary. Listen to these words by uh, Eugene Peterson who translated the Bible in something called the message. In Ephesians chapter one, he, he states this so clearly in verses 21 through 23. Here's how Eugene Peterson translates this particular verse. He says, and at the center of all this, Christ rules the church. The church, you see, is not peripheral to the world, but the world is peripheral to the church. The church is Christ's body in which he speaks and acts, and by which he fills everything with his presence. Oh, I love that. Because God's ultimate intentions is that he wants to fill the earth with his presence. God doesn't just want one small little piece of real estate. This world belongs to him. How is he gonna fill it with his presence? It's simple. He's gonna fill it through you. He wants to fill it through the church. God says, look, the church is not peripheral. In other words, it's not on the outside looking in at the world, trying to get the world convinced that we've got something worth offering or listening to. That's not it at all. We are the body of Christ. We are the physical representation of Jesus, the king of the nations on the earth. And everywhere that we go, it should be that we take the presence of God with us. As long as we think that we are second class citizens in this world, we will never step into the authority of first-class citizens in God's world. We need to have a revelation and an understanding that when God is moving, he's moving through the church first. What does that mean for us right now as we are going through this season and kind of coming out of it and looking on the horizons? Much like the children of Israel were standing on the hill country, these 12 spies that represented the 12 tribes of Israel, they're up in the hill country looking down into the land of Canaan and they can literally for the first time see the promises of God. 
the land that he's promised. How are we looking at our future? Are we looking at it with fear and trepidation? Are we looking at it and going, I hope there's still a place for us in the world? Are we looking at the chaos that sin is producing and man's inhumanity to man is producing and viruses are producing and economies are producing and nation against nation is producing? Are we, are we allowing the news media? Are we allowing social media? Are we allowing that to shape how we're going to enter into the promised land that God is giving to us called the future, or are we allowing God to shape our hearts in this hour and give us a prophetic imagination, an imagination that is shaped by the Spirit of God so that when we look even at a world that is dark and broken and void and empty, in a world that even has enemies, spiritual enemies that need to be vanquished. Are we looking at the darkness the way that God looks at the darkness, speaking light into it, or are we being overwhelmed by the darkness and running and hiding? That's the question. God wants to produce a new perspective. See, a, a new season requires a new mentality. It also re requires a new paradigm, a new perspective. We can't see through the old lens any longer because much like Israel, as we'll see as they go into the promised land, God is with them, but yet they've brought baggage with them out of Egypt. You know how it is when you land in a, in a new city or in a new town or you return home from a long trip. You've got your bags of stuff that you're bringing with you. And in there, you not only have the stuff you left home with in the first place, but oftentimes you bring stuff from where you came from. Do you know that we bring baggage with us from our sin? We bring baggage with us from how we were raised. We may even be tempted to bring baggage out of the last three and a half months with us into the next season. What God is saying is, I want to give you a new perspective. I want to give you a new set of lenses, but it's not going to be slave mentalities. It's not going to be bondage-oriented. It's not going to be fear-filtered. It's going to be the eyes of faith. God is wanting to download to us and give us new eyes, new faith, so that we can go into the land, that we can spy it out, and we can actually possess it. God's wanting us to get ready to cross over church. I believe with all of my heart, that in the next period of time, God wants the church to rise up in strength, in confidence, in unity like never before. I think even the things that we're experiencing right now in the nation, even though that they may be the, the result of, of sin that has impacted our culture and our world and the human heart, it doesn't matter. God works all things together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Why? It's because all things are for his glory. And right now, I believe that there are some things that look incredibly dire. I mean, we're going into an election year. If you thought COVID-19 was something and you thought the racial tensions in our nation were something, just wait for the election as it comes up in August, September, and October. If you want an opportunity to lose your peace, I got news for you. It's coming, and it's coming multiplied. But it doesn't mean that you have to. It doesn't mean that we have to allow the winds and the currents of the world to have control over our heart, our mind, our body, our words. We have been called to operate under self-control of the Holy Spirit. We're called to have a new mentality. And if we will, we can rise up as Jesus' body in the earth and we can fill our world with his presence. I wanna ask you a question today. And just imagine with me what it must have been like to be one of the 12 spies that Moses selects. And he says, you and you and you, one of the leaders of one of the 12 tribes. And here you are, you've been selected and Moses says, I want you guys to go through the Negev, the wilderness, the desert area, and come up to the high country, the hill country. And I want you to look down into the land then I want you to cross over into it and I want you to spy it out. The word spy in the Hebrew language means I want you to go and dis 
discover. I want you to go discover what kind of land it is. Imagine what it must have been like to stand on the hill and 12 of you, you sneak down into the land and you spy it out. You see what's going on and it's everything that God said it was going to be. Imagine what that must have been like. Use your imagination for a moment and just realize, think to yourself, I wonder, I wonder how I would respond to that in that moment. Because what we find very quickly is there were two significantly different responses to spying out the land. There was the majority mentality and there was the minority. There was a 10 to two split in how they perceived and how they saw their future because that's what the land represented. It was their future. God had spoken to them about their future, but now their future had arrived, and here they are. They're seeing it. They're touching it. They're walking on it. This is theirs. But they, as we'll see, they responded differently. Let me frame the question that I want to ask to you this way. What do you see when you look out at your future? From today, what do you see as a spy, God's invited you to look out on the horizons and look into your future. What do you see? What do you see when you think about your future? Do you see the goodness of God? Do you see the faithfulness and the steadfast mercies of the Lord? Or do you see trepidation? Do you see fear? Do you see an opportunity to revert and go back to the way life was before any of these things type, type of things have happened? Or have you been changed through the process? Some of us have been traumatized, but some of us have been changed. What do you see when you look out at your future? Well, how you see and what you see is determined by a couple other questions. Number one, it's determined by do you see the problem more than you see the promise? Because if you see the problem more than you see the promises of God, then the problem will overwhelm you. The problem will discourage you. The word discourage means to take courage out of. God wants to download courage in two. He says, be courageous. But if we see the problem and the problems that are in our future as being bigger than the promises of God, more trustworthy than the promises of God, then actually we will become discouraged and we will lose hope. In verse number 27, in this particular chapter, it says, we came to the land to which you sent us, and it flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. They brought back pomegranates, they brought back all the fruit. In fact, they had a cluster of grapes that was so big they had to put it on a pole and carry it on the shoulders between two individuals, which by the way is the exact same way that the priest carried the articles in the temple. Here they were, this was a sacred moment. They're bringing back a physical manifestation of the promises that God had made to them generations earlier, and here it is. He says, I'm gonna, you're gonna inherit a land that flows with milk and honey, which means it's fruitful, it's prosperous, and it's bigger. God's promises are bigger than we could have ever imagined. It takes two people to carry a cluster of grapes. You don't find that at Trader Joe's. And here they are, they're carrying the grapes, but yet their response is this. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong. And the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak. We saw the descendants of Anak. If you don't know who that is, the, the descendants of Anak, it was, it was the most feared figure in Hebrew mentalities because the sons of Anak were descendants of the Nephilim. And the Nephilim, if you go back and read Genesis chapter six, there was a time in which the angels, or fallen angels, watchers as they were called, literally came down and they had relations with the, the daughters of men and they gave birth to a line of giants that were like hybrid humans and demonic. And they were called the men of renown. It was one of the reasons why God destroyed the earth in the flood. And somebody might say, well, do you really believe that that took place? Yes, it absolutely took place. And... From that point, after the flood, when they were wiped out, there was constantly in their, in their back of their mind this fear 
that they're gonna run into these giants, these, descend, these supernaturally charged enemies of God's purposes in the earth. And when they go into the land, at least in their mentality, they saw the stature of the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, and all the, all the other ites. I think there was the Jebusites and the Canaanites and maybe even some mosquito bites, but they were in the land and they were massive. And they said, we saw the descendants of Anak. We saw the Nephilim. They're huge. Their cities are huge. Their walls are huge. They're fortified. They're strong. What did they see? They saw the problem more than they saw the promises. They're saying all this while they are holding a supernatural-sized cluster of grapes. They're talking about giant enemies instead of putting their focus on the giant promises. What about you? Do you see the problem or the promise? Because what we will find out here is that when the report comes, only two of the 12 spies gave a good report. Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb. Caleb's this this fiery individual and he comes back and he says, come on, we can go and we can take the land. Let's go, let's go. Let's possess it right now. The Bible actually goes on in Numbers chapter 14 and it talks about Caleb and it says, Caleb, is one of the two spies, Joshua the other one, that God is going to allow a generation later to go in and possess the promised land because it says that he had a different spirit. Chapter 14, verse 24 says, but my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land in which he went. The only two of the 12 spies that God will eventually allow to go in and possess the promised land are Joshua and Caleb. Why? It's because the other 10 saw the problem as being bigger than the promise. Listen, we don't ignore the problems. We've got problems. We have economic problems. We have racial problems. We have drug problems. We have education problems. We've got immorality problems. We've got comfort and complacency problems. The list is exhaustive. And if you think that they're big, they are. But in the midst of recognizing the problems, what God doesn't tell us to do is act like there aren't any problems. You may have gotten a bad medical report right now and the problem seems big. But can I just tell you, God is bigger than the problems. He's the same God who parted the Red Sea. He's the same God who defeated Pharaoh. He's the same God who turned the Nile into blood, who released uh, the flies and the frogs and all the other curses and all the other judgments on the nation of Egypt. He overthrew the most powerful empire in the world. God's not going to have any problem with some some nomadic tribes living in the middle of nowhere. He's not going to have any problems. It's like saying, I've already defeated the 98 Chicago Bulls. I'm not going to have any problems with the Gold Lake Junior High team. (laughs) God is bigger. But if in our mind we have not allowed God to shape our imagination into a prophetic imagination, one that sees the future through the eyes of God and doesn't see the future through the eyes of our fears, then what will happen is we will look out at our future and we will become discouraged and we'll become overwhelmed. Number two, are we listening to the voice of the majority or of his majesty? Are we listening to the voice of the majority or of his majesty, King Jesus? Who are we listening to more? In verse 31 and 32, it says, here here was the response. This was the majority response. We are not able to go up against this people. For they are stronger than we are. And so they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devour its inhabitants and all the people that we saw in it are of great stature. Well, of course, it's a land that doesn't devour its inhabitants because there are people living there. But what they were overwhelmed by was this consensus 
and this group think that was stirring among the 10 of the spies as they went in and they saw the challenges. They saw that there were giants. They saw that there were civilizations and they saw that they were cities. What they would have been all right with is God doing all the work for them. If God would just wipe them out, if he would send the angel of the Lord in, they would have been fine with that. But yet God is going to teach them how to make war. He's going to teach them how to possess the promises because what we'll find out next time that we look into this is when we, by the time we get to Joshua and Judges, when they go into the land, when they finally cross over the Jordan into the promised land, the manna stops. God stops feeding them on a daily basis because now it's time for them to plant, it's time for them to plow, it's time for them to sow, and it's time for them to reap because they've come into maturity concerning the promises of God. But when they come back and they give the report, there's only two that say we can go and take it. The rest of them say it's overwhelming. There's no way we can do it. We can't defeat the enemy. This is bigger than us. Well, of course it's bigger than you. It's always been bigger than you. Even when you thought you could handle it on your own, it was still bigger than you. The greatest mistakes that we make in our life are not attempting to do things by faith and failing. They are attempting to do things in our own strength only to realize we needed faith the whole time. Those are the greatest mistakes that we make. The majority voice will always be a negative voice. The majority voice will always be a negative. It will always be critical. It will always be judgmental. And I don't know where we got this mentality that we need to go with the flow of what everybody is saying and what everybody is doing. Because if you right now are spending too much time on social media and you're looking at the hashtags and the trends and what people are saying, you will get bitter, you will get angry, you might get confused, you might be frustrated, you feel like you're trying to drink water out of a fire hydrant and it will steal your peace from you because a bad report, if you, if you wanna be discouraged, let me tell you, you don't have to look far. If you wanna become fearful and riddled with anxiety, you don't have to even leave your home or your couch. It's available. It's called the voice of the majority. But I want to remind you what Jesus said. Jesus said, narrow is the way that leads to life. And few are they that find it. In other words, the path of the majority never leads to the abundant life. Narrow is the way, and few are they who find it. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. The quickest way to see your life dismantled and destroyed and to live below God's destiny and purpose for your life is just find out what the majority is doing and go with them and find out what the majority is saying and believe them and chime in with them and tag them and repeat everything that they are saying. But if you wanna get to life, what you need to find is you need to find the voice of his majesty. What does that mean? It means Make Jesus king of your life. Majesty is how we refer to royalty. And unfortunately in our culture, we don't treat Jesus like the king that he is. We treat Jesus like our life coach. We treat Jesus like a therapist or a counselor, a best friend, a homeboy. We treat Jesus like an avatar. We love for Jesus to amplify our beliefs and our prejudices. We shape Jesus to look just like us. Beware of Jesus that always agrees with you. Because when you come into the presence of a king, and Jesus is the king of kings, there's a confidence in his decrees, and there's an authority in his voice. And our call and our purpose is not to negotiate. You don't negotiate with a king. You submit to a king. And so much of what is going on right now, especially in the church, is a result of the fact that Jesus in his mercy is calling his church to repent. He's calling us to repent of a lot of things. They all center around the central idea that we love Jesus the Savior, but we don't want Jesus to be the Lord. We want Jesus to be the Son of God, 
but not his majesty. To where we bow down and we kiss the ring of the sun. You see, Jesus' report may not always be an easy report, but it's a good report. This is God's royal decree. And if there's ever been a time where we need to pay more attention to the feed of heaven, and we need to listen to the preceding word of God more than any other voice in our life, it is right now. Let me ask you, are we listening to the voice of the majority or of his majesty? One is a bad report. One is a destiny report. And the last question I'll ask is this. Are we seeing the real enemy? Are we seeing, seeing the real enemy? Verse 33 says, and we seemed to ourself like grasshoppers. And so were we to them. The New King James says it like this, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so were we in their sight. They were looking at the giants in the land. They were looking at their fortified cities and their walls. They were looking at their fields, their armies, their civilization, and it made them feel small. And they thought the enemies were too big in the land for them to defeat, but... Literally, they were looking at the wrong enemies because the only enemy that could keep them from entering and possessing the promised land was the enemy within. It was the enemy inside of them. It was their broken, fear-based belief systems. See, the real enemy for all of us is not out there. The real enemy is inside. Our beliefs about God our beliefs about ourselves and our belief systems about the world that he sent us into. That's the real enemy. A.W. Tozer in his great book called The Pursuit of God said this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. God never hurries. There are no deadlines against which he must work. Only to know this is to quiet our spirits and to relax our nerve. And the reason why many are still troubled, still seeking, still making little forward progress is because they haven't yet come to the end of themselves. The enemy is within. The enemy that can keep you from inheriting the promised land is not external, it's internal. What do you mean, Pastor Lee? Well, think about the words of Jesus. In Mark chapter seven, when he was confronted by the Pharisees about why his disciples didn't keep the traditions of the elders, Jesus said this, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, enver, envy, slander, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and they defile us. Jesus said the real enemy is within. It's the residue of the slavery and the bondage that we came out of. Oftentimes we think about the sin that Jesus saved us from and we're so, so thankful, so grateful for that. But can I tell you, even when sin has been washed away and forgiven, we still are people that have been raised and discipled and trained in Egypt. We still have belief systems. We still have mentalities. We still have an operating system that when triggered, when we stand on the horizons looking into what God calls our promise, our inheritance, our future, immediately fear rises up, envy rises up, anger rises up, division, coveting, evil thoughts, all of these things. You know what's interesting to me is that in chapter 14, in verse number four, it says when they realized that they were gonna have to fight, when they realized we're gonna have to go into battle, we're gonna have to operate by faith, we're gonna have to trust that God is stronger and he's gonna fight for us. 
when they realized that, their reaction to the enemy, to the land, which represented the promise for their future, and the battle that stood before them, their response was, God brought us out here to kill us. And then they said, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. What we believe about God is the most important thing about us. And a lot of times we find ourselves standing, looking into our future, and instead of faith rising up, dread rises up. All the stuff that comes to the surface that Jesus mentioned comes out of us. That's what defiles us and keeps us from entering into the promised land. And a lot of times what we'll do is we'll reject the leadership of God, look for another leader who will take us back into the land of familiarity where what we're feeling is native to everybody else. But that's not how you possess the promised land. How you possess the promised land, how you become someone that is qualified to walk in the destiny and the purpose it has for, that God has for you, is you come out of the wilderness and say, when I come out of this, I wanna believe you more, God. As I'm coming out of this, I wanna see through new lenses, I wanna see through a new set of spectacles that bring into focus the kingdom of God. I'm not getting wrapped up in arguments. I'm not gonna join sides of human battles and I'm not gonna walk in fear. I'm not gonna be triggered. I am going to, as Galatians 5 says, it was for freedom that Christ has set you free. Therefore, don't be entangled again with a yoke back into slavery. Don't go back into Egypt. Don't find a leader because you'll find one who will willingly take you back into the land of Egypt, back into your bondage, back into your familiarity. No, God wants to be the one that leads you into the promised land and fights your battles, but you're going to have to rise up in faith and say, God, I believe you are bigger than the enemy and the promises and the fortresses that the enemy has set up. As Caleb said, they are bread for us. The enemy is bread for us. God has prepared a meal for us. God is gonna bring satisfaction to us as we possess the promises of God together. Would you bow your heads with me right where you're at? In your homes, your living rooms, maybe with a watch party, on your mobile device, it doesn't really matter. You might be sitting outside on your back deck today. But in this moment, I want you to know that the Holy Spirit is here. He's in this moment. He's with you. And if you could only grasp, if we could only grasp what God sees out in your future, it may not be the easy path, and it's gonna require some fighting and some battle, but it's gonna be weapons of the Spirit, not weapons of the flesh. It's gonna be defeating the enemies that are within. Surrender, repentance. Saying, God, retrain me to think, renew my mind, God. I want faith to rise up. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I wanna trust the voice of your majesty over the voice of the majority. God, I wanna see the promises bigger than the problems. And I wanna walk in step with your Holy Spirit. I don't wanna be peripheral to the world. I don't wanna see myself as a grasshopper. I wanna see myself as a conqueror, a possessor, a son of God, one who reigns and rules, one who was called and appointed for this time and this hour. It's no accident that I am in the earth in the time that I am living through a pandemic in the middle of a nation that is looking for answers and peace and reconciliation and healing. It's no accident that I live in Southwest Michigan or some other city that you are in. God orchestrated it, he originated it, and he will bring it to pass. Every one of his purposes, you are not alone. God says, I'm gonna fill the earth, I'm gonna fill your city, I'm gonna fill this generation with the glory of the Lord just like the waters cover the sea and I'm looking for you to rise up and look out on the horizons and believe what I say and to agree with me and to respond with that spirit of faith that was in Caleb and in Joshua that says we are well able to go into this generation and to bring hope. We are well able to push back darkness and to bring light. We are well able to declare our God reigns in the midst of a world that's looking for 
God to break in, we are carriers of the presence of Jesus. He's looking for you to believe that once again. He's looking for you to come out of this season and say, that was hard. The wilderness was hard, but God showed himself faithful. And I believe, I believe his words are true. I believe he is with me. I believe that the best is yet to come. I wanna pray right now over you and then we're gonna worship. But Lord, right now, I'm just praying for every one of us that you would stir within us faith that you would give us new eyes to see, new ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. Lord, let new levels of faith rise up on the inside of us so that we are a people prepared to cross over. People prepared to cross over. We don't wanna be the generation that wanders in the wilderness because we put you to the test and we did not believe you. God, we wanna be that Joshua generation that's ready to go in and take possession of what you have promised us. Holy Spirit, move in our hearts. Stir us in this hour. Prepare us for what is to come. In Jesus' name, amen.